Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. And let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Because you are good. You're good. Oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sail.
your sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found this is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me and where you soul to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Welcome to Milton Bible Church Online. It's great to be together. We're doing something a little different today because we're having church uh, in person outside. So we're doing a little pre-recording in order to uh, make sure that we are commu communicating properly to our entire church family and our wider church family online. Well, today is Vision Sunday. And it's a day where we cast vision for the future and we begin to kick off our fall programs. I want to tell you about the theme of the fall here at Milton Bible Church. Here's the theme. The theme is hard reset, restoring the church to its default setting. Again, hard reset, restoring the church to its default settings. So in other words, what we're talking about is restoring the church to biblical foundations. That's what we want to be about. So let me tell you really quickly what's going on. Then we're going to get into the scriptures. So first of all, September 17th, a bunch of different things are going to happen. A bunch of new things are going to happen as we restore the church to what we believe God intends for it to be by the teaching of his word. So beginning next week, we want to restore the ministry of the word of God to our children. We want to restore the ministry of the word of God to our children. So the first thing that's going to happen is that we will have nursery and we will have toddlers staff in both our 9.30 a.m. and our 11 a.m. services. So we will have fully staffed uh, toddlers and nursery staff for all those who would come. And then on October the 17th, which will be about a month later, we will kick off our first full power kid staff. So that's for ages uh, kindergarten to grade six. And that'll be for the 930 service. And then we hope to for uh, one month later to have 
at our 11 a.m. service, another full staff for Power Kids. So within the next few months, we will have a complete, fully staffed uh, children's program for nursery to grade six to meet during both of our services. It's very important to us, the ministry of the Word of God to our children in helping to shape minds, hearts, and homes. Also, I wanted to let you know that on the 19th, we're gonna start church bulletins will be available again. What we're gonna do is we're gonna scale back our church-wide e-blasts, and what we are going to be doing is we are uh, developing a brand new uh, website which all of our information will be on. As well, we will have church bulletins that, for people to pick up while they're uh, at, at, at the building to let them know everything that's happening in the life of the church. We'll use eBlast just in the case of special occasions, emergencies, that kind of thing. And so we're gonna scale that back, but we're gonna promote our communication in other ways. We also want to restore the operation of spiritual gifts in both of our Sunday morning meetings. One of the things that we value at Milton Bible Church is the operation of the spiritual gifts during our morning meetings. The spontaneous contributions that people can make as the Spirit of God begins to move in our meetings. And so what we will be doing is we'll be opening that up during both meetings on Sunday mornings. What will happen is this. We'll be recording our early service at 9.30 a.m., editing it, and then posting it a little while later. It'll be posted at 1 p.m. because that's the amount of time that we need to make everything happen well. So that will, again, that will start next week on September the 19th. We want to continue to uh, grow in the things of the Spirit and all things will done in a decent and orderly way and uh, with the purpose of for the purpose of strengthening and building up the church. Also, I want you to understand that next week, September 19th, we're going to restore the ministry of welcoming, welcoming newcomers to Milton Bible Church. So we will be having a hang loose with the leaders immediately after the 11 a.m. meeting. It'll be a family-friendly pizza lunch in which we will share the mission, vision, and values of Milton Bible Church. You're gonna to get to meet some of the leaders that are around. You're gonna to get to meet some other people that are new. And as well, you're gonna be able to uh, find out about next steps and get connected to the life of the church. We'll also have welcome packs available uh, for the first time in a long time for those who are new to MBC. So you can find out about next steps. You can read about things that are important to us. And there's gonna be some great gifts and some tasty treats in there for you as well. Well, today we're kicking off our fall theme. There's a lot happening and there's a lot that we are going to do to move the church forward during these days. But our theme for the fall, right up until our Christmas season, is going to be hard reset, restoring the church to its default settings. Restoring the church to its default settings. Do you know what? In this worldwide pandemic, God has shaken the nations and he has shaken the church. And do you know what? We will never return to 2019 again but we do have an opportunity to hit the reset button on church and to see it restored to the biblical essentials that are so important. Today, we're gonna to take a snapshot. We're gonna take a look at a Polaroid from Acts chapter two that shows us the life of the early church and what were the essentials there in that time. Acts chapter two. Well, today we're going to look at five essentials of the early church. So if you have a Bible, I would invite you to turn to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 42 to 47. It says this in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, 
and, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's take a moment to pray together. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the picture that you give us in Acts chapter two of the early church. The early days as the church begins to grow, as the spirit of God begins to move, as people begin to warm to the message and ministry of the church and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we pray that during these days, as we kind of move into a post-pandemic practice of church, we really want to capture that. We really want the heart of the early church to be our heart, the practices of the early church to be our practices, the essential of what was important during the days of the early church to be important essentials today. So we ask, Father, that you would hit the reset button and that we would have a hard reset and restore your church to the default settings, to the biblical essentials that you have built it upon. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, the first thing that we see when it comes to hitting, uh, restoring the church to its default settings, the first thing that we see is the word devotion. The word devotion. In Acts 2.42, it talks about the church being devoted, devoted to certain things. And it says that restoring the church begins with hitting the passion and the devotion level of the reset button in the life of a believing community. It is the passion level of the church that we're talking about. And the first thing we find is that they were devoted to the things of God and they were devoted to one another. As believers, we need to fan the flames of passion for the church. We need to see again the importance of Christ's church in the purposes of God. We need to understand how important it is for each and every person to be connected and committed to the life of the local church in order to reach full maturity in Christ, where a person's sanctification can be worked out in the context of authentic spiritual community. Because only in the context of close, intense spiritual community can we overcome the challenges of, get this, the challenges of personal selfishness, of immaturity, and ungodliness. And it's only in the context of a vibrant local church can we embrace the full impact of the presence of the Holy Spirit. You know what? The Spirit of God, he comes to indwell a body, to fill a temple, and to fortify an army, a spiritual army, that is. Do you know what? In Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 18, Jesus is entering into uh, Caesarea Philippi with his disciples and he asks them some questions he says to them who do people say that I am and some of them responded saying well some say you're John the Baptist others say you're Elijah others say that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets and then Jesus asked them but who do you say that I am and Simon Peter you know, the typical guy that pipes up for the first time, first guy to always talk. He says, these, he says these great words. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And you know what Jesus does? When Jesus recognizes that, he moves Peter from understanding who Christ is right into the commission that he's called him to build his church. Listen to what Jesus says. 
He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I will tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What Jesus does, he says, right on, you got it. You know who I am. I am the Messiah, the son of the living God. So now that you've got that, let's go build church. Let's go build church. You know what? Christianity is more than just a Jesus and me thing or a Jesus and my family thing. You see, when Peter made his confession of Jesus as God and Messiah, Jesus didn't focus solely on that. In fact, he moved Peter's thinking immediately to the church. You know, when we confess Christ, God doesn't leave us to get on with things alone. He immediately gives us a church. And the church is Jesus' idea. I want you to understand that. The church was initiated by Jesus. Jesus established it. And you know what? He said he would fight the gates of hell for it. That's pretty high commitment. You see, the church is God's plan A for the redemption of mankind. There is no plan B. And what does the Bible say happens at the end of the age? At the end of the age, before eternity is ushered in, our Heavenly Father will throw the greatest party of all time. It will be held in honor of his son and, and presented to the son will be his great love, his beautiful bride, his radiant uh, uh, love that, that he has passion for. And do you know who that is? It's the church, the church, his bride. Listen, as a church, I want to call us all those who follow Christ, to give our hearts and souls to restore the beauty of the radiant and magnificent bride of Christ during these post-pandemic days. So let me ask you a question. Will you give your time, your finances, your energy, your emotion to making the bride of Christ beautiful again? restoring her to the beauty that, that is hers, the radiance in which she uh, operates and emanates the bride of Christ that he loves so very much. We need to have a sense of urgency that God will stir up our motivation to rediscover authentic church life that leads to spiritual maturity in its members that will be a brilliant testimony of the, uh, to the world and what the people of God truly ought to be. Christ's radiant and beautiful church. Do you know what? It doesn't take anything to sit there and criticize the church and say, oh, this is wrong and oh, that is wrong. You know what? We can all recognize the failings and shortcomings, but know this, that God himself is committed to the building of the church and the mission of Jesus is seeing his kingdom come and seeing his church go forward in power. We need to battle as God gives us grace for the restoration of the church during these days days especially. So the first key to restoring the post-pandemic church is devotion. Devotion. So let me ask you, what's your devotion meter reading right now? What's your devotion passion gauge? You know, where's it set at? And, and let me ask you another question. If everybody had the same level of passion as you, what kind of a church would we have? Is it time to raise the bar? Is it time to hit the reset button and raise the level of devotion and passion to make the bride of Christ beautiful, to present her radiant and, 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 and gorgeous to, to the bridegroom when that time comes? 
let me ask you something. Do you hear the heartbeat of the crucified Christ for his bride? Is your heart pounding to make her beautiful and to present her, the bride, the church, to the bridegroom, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? I'm talking about passion here. Passion. I love the church. The church, to me, is magnificent and spectacular. And I think it's time to make her beautiful again and to really go hard after God for that. Second thing we see when it comes to a hard reset is that they were devoted, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Do you know what? As in a, in a New Testament pattern church, Jesus, as revealed in the Holy Scriptures, will be central, will be the center of all things. And the early Christians studied their Old Testament. They, they listened to the teaching of the apostles. They got the letters from the apostles. They read them and they heard them and they followed them with a radical passion, a radical sense of obedience. That was their heart's desire. And those letters that were written are now what we call the New Testament. Do you know what? Hitting the reset button, a church will believe that the Bible is the word of God. In preaching, the speaker doesn't focus on his own ideas, but he wants to discern what is in the book and then preach the heart of God that is written here in the book for all to know and for all to be shaped by. You see, our focus isn't just about hearing the word of God, it's about radically obeying the word of God. When God's people gather together, they need to hear from God. And even Jesus pointed to the Father when he spoke. Listen to what he said in John 14, 10. He said, the words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. As the church, we need to bring not our own thoughts, but we need to bring the thoughts of the Father. When we gather together, whether it be in large groups or small groups, we are desperate to hear from God. Do you know what? In 2003, our church in Milton was involved in what I would consider one of the worst building programs in Christian history. Um, <clears throat> our original budget was 750000 and it spiraled out of control to $2.2 million dollars. We went from a renovation project to a total rebuild. And I remember one Christmas Eve, I thought I would drive past, um, I would drive past the building. We had met at Milton District High School and on my way home by myself, I thought I'm just gonna drive past uh, the project. We had spent to that point almost $1 million and we had absolutely nothing but a hole in the ground in downtown Milton to show for it. The church had nothing left in the bank. I was alone, I was in the car, and as I pulled up to my house on Christmas Eve, I began to cry uncontrollably. I could see no way out. We were broke. We had nothing but a hole in the ground in downtown Milton. I had no hope. I had no future. I thought, this is my last Christmas in Milton. Merry Christmas, Jim. But then the word of the Lord came to me. In Ezekiel chapter 37, this is what the Lord said to me. He said, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And what the Lord told me that night was where I saw bones, he saw an army. Where I saw death, he saw life. 
where I saw an end, he saw a beginning that life was about to emerge. And it was in the midst of despair that the word of God gave me great hope. Do you know what? Today, we have a building twice the size of our building downtown. And it has become a greater center for outreach and gospel proclamation that I ever dreamed possible. In fact, one of the projects that we've been working on is with one of our community partners called No One Goes Hungry. And it's a, 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 it's a, a Milani, it's a, just a beautiful godly woman who has a heart to see that no one goes hungry in Milton, no one goes hungry in Georgetown, no one goes hungry in, in Oakville, Burlington, no one goes hungry in Halton. And you know, just a week or so ago, in our community partnership, Milani and I rejoiced that 100,000 meals have gone out to that, towards that project. No one goes hungry. One of the things that I find exciting is that when I drive by 200 Main Street, that there's a church there that I love. And you know what it's called? Southside at 200 Main. What a great name. I love that church. It's a gospel proclamation church with a great people. There's still a great presence there of God and his people in the heart of downtown Milton. Do you know, I believe with all my heart that the word of God brings maturity and it brings hope and it brings life and it brings new beginnings to all those who would hear and all those who would radically obey. Even in the darkest days, God will bring you the light of his word. You see, the restoration of the church begins with a passion to fall in love with the apostles' teaching about Jesus, his teachings, and what he would say to us as his church. Another biblical foundation of the early church was fellowship. Fellowship. Fellowship being spiritual relationships. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says this, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Do you know what? The church is not a building you go to. It's a family that you belong to. People who are born again by the grace of God through faith, who are committed to Jesus and to one another. Charles Colson said this. He said, how many times have you heard people say, let's go to church? First century believers did not say, let's go to church. They said, we are the church. You see, the church of Jesus Christ is us. Don't speak of it as a building because Jesus never did. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it says, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Do you know what? The church is not a club that you can join. It is God that saves us and immediately puts us into, the, into church in order to be part of his program for eternity. You see, the Lord added you to his church and he calls you into the love of the fellowship that he desires for you. So understand this, he wants us to love the people. We're talking about community, relationships, that are committed to one another in Christ. Do you know, New Testament Christians, they loved each other like members of a family. They spent time together. They shared meals. They even sold their possessions so that no one would go without. Listen to what it says in Acts chapter 4. It says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own but they had everything in common. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. 
In other words, the early church, they liquidated their assets. They sold their houses. They sold their cars. They sold their donkeys. I mean, everything they had, they laid it at the apostles' feet. They wanted to make sure that no one went without. Do you know, I'm standing right here in this gorgeous building. Called it, we called it the Connect Center. We didn't call it Milton Bible Church. We did that for a reason. Because this building is not Milton Bible Church. The people of Milton Bible Church are Milton Bible Church. The people are Milton Bible Church. It's so important that we understand that. It's so important that we say, you know what? This building, this building is not the church. You, if you're listening right now, you are the church. And you know what? I am devoted to you. And I trust that you are devoted to me. And devoted together will restore the church to its default setting, to its biblical essential of fellowship. We've got Connect Group starting up again at NBC. You know, that's our small group ministry. A good church just doesn't do Sundays. They're going to meet through the week. They're going to meet in coffee shops. They're going to meet in small groups. Not only will a church meet in organized meetings, but members will seek out each other in friendship, both formally and informally. They'll be devoted to fellowship. Two more. The third thing, or the fourth thing, they'll be devoted to the breaking of bread. Acts 2.42 says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread. A hard reset in restoring the church is attending to the Lord's table or communion. The early church practiced the Lord's table, it says, from home to home. Bread and wine were taken as Jesus commanded. And in a biblical church, breaking bread is not a formal, somber Sunday morning meeting, but it is a celebration of the amazing sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross to deliver us from our sin, to restore us into relationship with the Father and with one another, reconciled together, family together. That's what the breaking of bread does. It constantly points to our redemption in Christ and our future hope eschatologically with him forever. So let me ask you a question. What would it be like if every time you had Christian friends over to your house that you just took the time and said, okay, hold on a minute, we're gonna break bread. We're gonna get out some bread, we're gonna get out some juice, and we're gonna remember what Christ has done for us and just be grounded in friendship in Jesus. I'll tell you something, that would change the dynamic of that night. That would change the dynamic of your relationships devoted to the breaking of bread. I think it would help to restore the church to biblical essentials. And then the last thing is prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. You see, the New Testament said that believers prayed together a lot. They prayed alone. They prayed in groups. They prayed in times of peace. They prayed in times of trouble. Why? Because God says, if we pray, then he will act. A great church cannot go forward without a healthy prayer life. Listen to what Isaiah says. In Isaiah 62, this is a great verse. He says, you who call upon the name of the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. What what Isaiah says is, listen, go hard after God until the whole world points at Jerusalem where God's people live (laughs) And, and they're, praising what an amazing place that is and people that is because God is in the midst of their company. It's a fabulous invitation to prayer. I've got a friend that has a song and it's based on this. His name is Brian Houston and some of you know him. The song goes like this. 
I will cry out to you till I know your ears are sore and I won't let go till you bless me, Lord. A passion for prayer. A passion to go hard after God in prayer needs to be restored to the church. You know what? The Lord invites us to be bold and to be relentless in prayer and in approaching him. We are called to pursue him with a relentless passion and perseverance for the glory of the name of Jesus Christ throughout all the earth. Spectacular, spectacular. Can you see? I'm getting a little excited here. I'm getting a little cranked up. Because in my heart, it's time to hit the reset button, a hard reset to restore the church to its default setting, to restore the church to its biblical essentials, to be the people that God has called us to be. Now is the time. Today is the day. This is the adventure that God is calling us on. And I hope that you will join us and be a part of that as we look to see his kingdom come and to see the church of Jesus Christ go forward in power. You know, A. A. Milne wrote these words in a book that he wrote called Winnie the Pooh. And uh, I love this little quote, but it says this, Christopher Robin was sitting outside his door putting on his big boots. And as soon as he saw the big boots, Pooh knew that, a, that an adventure was going to happen. And he brushed the honey off his nose with the back of his paw, and he spruced himself up as best he could so as to look ready for anything. Understand this. God is calling us to a great adventure in Christ. He is calling us to a hard reset, restoring the church to its default settings, embracing the biblical essentials that made the early church great. And it's time to grab a hold of those again with all our hearts. Are you ready for that big adventure? Let me ask you, do you got your big boots on? Are you going to put them on? because it's time to get going. It really is. In fact, it's past time to get going. God has more in store for his church, so much more. He's got more in store for our community. He's got more in store for our nation and in the nations. So let's get going. It's time for a great adventure. Let's pray together. Father, we wanna thank you for the great adventure that you are calling us to in this post-pandemic world in Christ Jesus. We thank you that you have shaken the world and you have shaken the church. And I know that those who remain faithful to you, those who remain steadfast, devoted to the things of God and the Lord Jesus Christ are ready for an adventure. And so we pray that this church would be a place where the word of God is loved passionately, where we hear the word of God and we obey the word of God with all of our hearts. Father, not only would we be devoted to the apostles' teaching, but we would also be devoted to the fellowship where we would love one another, where people who walk in to our midst would know that there's something different where people will find their uh, brokenness made beautiful. Their loneliness will just cease to exist because they found that fellowship, that company that they've always looked for in God. We pray, Lord, that you would stir us up in our love for the saints, our love for one another. And we pray that you would just continue to do these things, Lord to the breaking of bread where you are central in all things, to the passionate, persevering prayers that you call us to make. May we be that people. And Lord, may we see signs and wonders. May we see 
you adding day by day such as should be saved. And may we see a place where there is no need that is unmet, where your people who love each other, dedicated to one another, live together in a sense of unity and harmony, all pulling together, working hard for the sake of your kingdom and your glory and your name to be famous. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, church, I hope you're ready for a great adventure. It's time to just really get going. I'm so excited about it, and I hope you are too. We'll be seeing you soon, and uh, I look forward to seeing all of us, uh, all of you, all of us together in person once again. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you. In my wrestling and in my doubt, in my failures you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, oh you are the peace in my troubled sea. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence you won't let go. In the questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead us through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore morning I'll rise and sing. My God's love will lead us through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Safe to shore.
to show up.